Yeah, we've got a good healthy attendance. Live stream. Well, you're not yet. <laughs> oh. No, no, I, uh, I can see the problem. It's gone to the wrong root YouTube channel, that's why. Wow, it's it's so lovely that um, people have chosen to join us on their Saturday afternoon, and on such a lovely day as well. On their day off, yeah, it's such a beautiful day. I I guess people are all over the place, but I'm actually in West Yorkshire right now, and it's a really gorgeous day. It's it's a little bit like the start of The Simpsons, where it's blue sky with those really cartoon-like clouds drifting by. And um, today, it's lovely. Right, for those who are watching, I'm I'm still trying to connect the YouTube audience. Um, having gone to the wrong right, I think it's. Dave, can you tell me if that's appearing now on YouTube? It's not at the moment, Robin. No. I can still see the live specials, but uh, not today's one. Oh. Technology, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it wonderful, yeah. yeah. Good when it works. I think I've gone to the, exactly. the Popastro um, setting this time. And... Well, it certainly seems to be, I can see it on my copy of YouTube. Um, oh, it yes, seems it's, come, to be going it's come up out. now. It's come up. Now. It's so come we're, up. We're right, running. okay, we're everybody. Up running, folks, so we're, the, we're up and running. Sorry about stuff. the delay on those of you who are watching on Zoom, but so we have to connect it to YouTube and it takes a little while to do so. Well, a good afternoon, everybody, all you uh, Pop Astro folk. Nice to see you all. And as you can see, there's, uh, there's myself, uh, Robin Schedule. Uh, Stephen Sargent, our president, couldn't be here that he's, uh, today. He's got family commitments, and uh, so fair enough. And uh, you can see that we've also got Dave Eagle, who will be doing the uh, the back uh, the, the back of studio work and making sure that everything goes smoothly. And we've got Tim Gregory here, who's broadcasting from West Yorkshire. There he is, and um, uh, he is from the he is a research scientist with the British Geological Survey. But he tells me that he's been. Uh, living, sleeping, and indeed eating meteorites for the last five years, but he withdrew the the, the bit about eating when questioned. <laughs> so, um, without any further ado, uh, welcome to everybody. We've got participants uh, rolling in galore. I hope you're all here now. And uh, so, I've asked um, Tim to share his screen, which he is. And over to you, Tim. Wonderful. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak. It's it's always great to speak to. Um, it's always great to, to preach to the converted. So talking with the Society for Popular Astronomy, Society for Popular Astronomy is 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 great, and especially on a you know on a weekend. I, I make a point of those who have been here for a minute or two will have heard me say this, but I always make a point of, of saying that when I speak to, to public audiences that it, it it astounds me in the best possible way that people choose to spend their spare time to listen to to scientists speak about their subjects. You know, spare time is is hard earned and especially when it's the weekend and it's a lovely day so i'm really grateful that that you've come to listen today about meteorites which is the subject that well it's the subject that i'm going to be talking about today it's the subject that i've been researching for the last five years four of those years as a phd student and and just over another year as as a as a research scientist and it's also incidentally the subject of my new book which is out. So I guess this, this talk is almost like part of my virtual book talk, because I did plan on going around the country, speaking to people in person to, to, to talk about the subject of meteorites, a lot of the things that are in my book, sign copies. Alas, we can't do that in the current climate. So in a way, it's kind of good, because I get to speak to audiences where, in places where I wouldn't have normally get, gotten to go. So. so I'm starting out with this image, which is, this is really a picture of my workspace. 
over the last five years or so. This is in a clean laboratory and it looks sterile because it is. Clean laboratories are some of the, well, as the name suggests, some of the cleanest places on the planet. And to go in there, you have to go through a whole, a whole wood chipper of health and safety. You have to sign all the forms. You have to get gowned up, hair nets, gloves, special boots, special sleeves, special lab coats. It's a completely dust free environment. And the reason that these labs are so clean, the reason that clean labs are so clean, is because any amount of dust that might make its way into our samples, in the case of me, my meteorite samples, could catastrophically contaminate them. It would be, it would be like if a piece of dust fell into one of my beakers, the, the, the elements that are in the dust, even that tiny mote of dust that's just in the air all around us all the time, that the elements in that dust would completely outnumber the elements in the tiny, tiny crumb of meteorite. And so we go to extraordinary lengths to keep our laboratories clean. And this is, this is a picture of exactly what I saw when I looked into the fume cupboard and I've got my different acids there. I've got my lovely pipettes. And on the left there, you can see all my beakers all nicely lined up and organized. Um, in each one of those beakers, there's a tiny, tiny, tiny crumb of meteorite. And I took this photograph last month, in fact, in the lab. And, um, and I, that experiment went well, I can confirm. And this is, this is a logical survey, um, hairnet and all. And this um, picture was taken pre post lockdown haircut. Um, I got quite long hair during lockdown, but sort of back, back to it. So that, that's what I do for a job. I'm a cosmochemist. I'm actually a geologist by training. Um, it's, it always feels a little strange. I almost feel a little impostery when I talk to astronomical societies because I guess usually astronomers, I guess most of them come from a physics background or an engineering background. Um, but actually geologists have a lot to offer the game as well. Um, there's an old saying that nobody knows a rock better than a geologist. And, um, and having seen thousands of rocks during my undergraduate degree and, and learned the ins and outs of rock formation and what different, different chemical trends can tell us, different mineralogical combinations, you can apply the exact same science to rocks. Well, you can apply them to rocks beneath your feet, but you can also apply them to rocks that fall from above your head, meteorites. And of course, meteorites are pretty much the only pieces of space that we can hold in our hands and tease apart in immense detail in the laboratory. And so it was at least surprising to me when I learned about this, but there's actually a huge community of research scientists from a geological background who are getting in on the game of space science. So I don't feel like a complete imposter talking to an astronomical society, but um, as I will hopefully show you in this talk, um, geologists also have a lot to offer the subject of space science, and we've made some fantastic discoveries using meteorites that extend not just outwards into our own solar system, but beyond and into the stars. And so with that, this is, um, this is my title slide, which is also the name of, of, of my book that's just come out, Meteorite, the stones from outer space that made our world. Now, before I delve into the ins and outs of meteorites as objects and what we've learned from them, I'm going to start somewhere perhaps a little peculiar. I'm going to start in Egypt. Um, well, ancient Egypt, I guess, but more specifically, a little bit further on than that, back in about 1925, when King Tutankhamun's tomb was discovered by archaeologists. And amongst the many treasures that lay waiting in King Tutankhamun's tomb, his, his pharaoh tomb, was this wonderful sarcophagus where his, where his mummified remains were, were kept for thousands of years. And the archaeologists, they were, they were interested in, well, I guess they're interested in lots of different things, the archaeologists, but, you know, King Tutankhamun was of great interest to the archaeological community. And so the immense detail that has been studied in has thrown up lots of interesting things. But I think one of the most interesting is this. This is a dagger that was wrapped in King Tutankhamun's linen. It was actually just there, on his, on, just on his left chest, just, just, just below his shoulder blade. And this dagger is about year long. It's about the length of my forearm. It's about 12 inches long, about 30 centimeters. Um, this dagger, this beautiful, it's got mother of pearl hilt on the handle, and it's got this gold sheath that the, the, the sheathing the blade. But it's the blade itself that's more interesting than the gold sheath, because it turns out, that the metal from which King Tutankhamun's dagger is made is mostly made of iron, metallic iron, which is curious because the time when this dagger was made, around the time when King Tutankhamun died, 
the Iron Age hadn't started. The technology to purify and smelt iron from iron ore hadn't been invented yet. And so this immediately raises a question, where on earth did the craftspeople who made this sacred dagger fit for a pharaoh get their iron from? And I guess the subject of this talk is perhaps a little bit of a giveaway, but it turns out that when a group of cosmochemists, a group of geologists and meteoriticists like myself, they went to the Cairo Museum with an instrument called an X-ray fluorescence spectrometer. And this, you essentially bombard an object with electrons, a high beam of elect a high current beam of electrons, and it begins to glow in different colours. And the colours that the material begins to glow in, you can calculate the composition of the material. And it turns out that the composition of King Tutankhamun's dagger is essentially identical to the composition of iron meteorites, which is it's an inescapable conclusion that the, the, the iron dagger from which King Tutankhamun's blade was forged from was forged from an iron meteorite. And so humanity's fascination with meteorites is not just a recent thing. You know, we've only, I say we, European scientists and the Enlightenment scientists only really accepted meteorites as a credible area of study back in the early 1800s. It was actually 1802 when the first proper systematic chemical analysis of meteorites was published. But humanity has been fascinated with meteorites for thousands of years, at least as far back as the ancient Egyptians. And while we'll never know if the ancient Egyptians really did see an iron meteorite fall from the sky and they went and picked it up and brought it back and, and crafted this beautiful object out of it, or whether they just happened across this strange, unknown, exotic, metallic material out in the desert, it is tantalizing that they did perhaps know where it came from because around the same time that King Tutankhamun's dagger was made, these hieroglyphics came into common usage. And the literal translation of this hieroglyphic is iron from the sky. And so, you know, while we'll never quite know for sure, it is at least interesting to think about. And it is a tantalizing possibility that before meteorites became accepted as real objects that did fall from outer space in, in the 1800s, to 200 years ago. Actually, the ancient Egyptians had cottoned onto this and accepted it thousands of years ago, which is, which is, which is wonderful, I think. And it, it blew me away when I learned that. And it wasn't just the Egyptians either. Um, this is, this is a, a famous book by um, Laplace called The History of the World. And it was a documentation of the history of the world up to that point. Um, I just had to point this out because it's such, well, it's such a crazy um, engraving. I've no idea what's going on because I can't read the language and I haven't looked up a translation, but I just had to point it out because those, those chaps do not look happy. Um, but that, that's a, a distraction. The real thing that's interesting about this book is that it documents the fall of another meteorite in, in 1492 called the Enzysheim meteorite. And this fell in the, well, it fell just outside the city of Enzysheim, actually. And it fell in the midday and the people who saw it fall rushed over to the scene of the fall and immediately began chipping pieces off it and using them as sacred talismans. And even today, the meteorite is in the city. They, they took it inside the walls of the city. And it was commandeered at one point by French revolutionaries and moved to a different city. But it's now back in Enzersheim and it's on proud public display in a lovely glass cabinet in the museum there. And this is the oldest meteorite for which um, solid pieces still remain that's actually got a confirmed fall, which is kind of kind of cool. So we've been fascinated with meteorites for a long, long time. And my fascination with meteorites really began, well, I've always been interested in rocks and space, but it wasn't really until I was, you know, a couple of years into my undergraduate degree that I realized that, oh my gosh, there's a group of people who actually research rocks from outer space with their job. And that's what led me to do PhD at the University of Bristol in that building, although admittedly I was in the basement of that building, so I didn't get to experience its grandeur during the day, but it was kind of nice walking in there every day. And I spent four years in the basement of that building teasing apart meteorites on the, well, literally the atomic level using instruments called mass spectrometers, specifically to date meteorites and calculate how old they are. Because one of the things that really sets meteorites apart from all other rocks is their antiquity. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on in the talk. And being, well, they're essentially the oldest objects we can hold in our hands. Being the oldest rocks, they tell us the oldest stories. And it turns out that meteorites can take us way further back in time 
than simply Earth's geological history. They can take us back to the inception of the rock record itself, the solar system rock record, right back to the point in time when our solar system was forming from a giant cloud of gas and dust and coalescing itself into the nice clockwork solar system of planets that we all enjoy today with our telescopes. And of course, we live on one of those planets, which is kind of a bonus as well. So before I delve down into into rocks. I guess this is a nice place to start. This is a, it's a nebula. And I'm sure a lot of, a lot of the people watching this have probably seen nebula themselves through telescopes. Um, although this was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. So, but you know, there are some, you know, some of the ground based um, amateur astronomy photography is, is, is on a par with some of the Hubble stuff, I think anyway. But um, this, is, this is a really wonderful example of, of a nebula. And it's this giant cloud of interstellar gas and dust. And the reason that it's glowing is because in the midst of these nebula, there are brand new stars flickering to light. And when, when these young stars flicker to light, they heat up the gas around them and cause the gas to glow incandescent, which is why we can see these nebula, the specific type of nebula that are called the emission nebulas, because they're emitting light out into their surroundings and indeed across interstellar space, which is why we can see them. And we're at a point in time now where astronomers, the telescopes are just absolutely unbelievable. The engineers who design these things are honestly, they're, they're, they've got to be some of the smartest people on the planet because we can actually delve into the midst of these nebula to look at brand new star systems. And this is an example of one of these brand new star systems that's just forming in, in this nebula. Now, right in the center of that image of inside the, the sort of, it looks a bit like Sauron's eye from Lord of the Rings, the sort of, the sort of bullseye um, image that you can see there in red right in the center of that there's a brand new star and the reason there's a brand new star in there is because nebula are the places where stars form and around these brand new stars they begin to coalesce the gas in their immediate surroundings and as this gas collapses down onto the central star it begins to it begins to spin and the reason that they begin to spin is because these these nebula you know if, if you look at a nebula for even a thousand years, they appear not to move, but they're, they actually are moving, but very, very, very slowly. But when they begin to contract, they begin to get faster, they begin to speed up. Now, anybody, when we were all back in the office before lockdown, and you know, it was a Friday afternoon, and we're all slacking off a little bit, and you're all spinning around on your office chairs, um, you can actually do this at home if you've got an office chair. If you spin around on your office chair and you stick your arms and legs out, you'll, you'll spin at a a moderate rate but then if you tuck your arms and legs in you'll start to spin faster and that's exactly what happens with these nebula the physics is pretty much identical so as these nebula begin to collapse these slowly turning nebula begin to collapse they spin up like a ballerina pirouetting on point and in physics things that spin tend to want to get flat and you can do this with your office chair as well. If you put a cardigan or a jacket on the back of your office chair and spin round, you'll notice that the cardigan will splay outwards. It wants to flatten out. Spinning things tend to flatten out in physics. So these, these initially formless clouds of gas and dust, these nebulae, they collapse, they spin up faster as a consequence. And because of the spinning faster, they flatten out to form disks. And it's in these disks that planets form. And the reason that this image is so remarkable is because the gaps that you can see in that ring are actually the feeding zones of brand new planets. We're witnessing planet formation, the formation of new worlds in real time using telescopes, which is wonderful. And just to give you an idea of how amazing this image is, this is about the orbit of Pluto. Um, so, you know, this, this structure is pretty huge, but the resolution to which we can now glimpse and image them is, is Right, astronomical. Um, and now I'm just going to run through that solar system formation um, in a little bit more detail with, um, with the aid of a cartoon that I made. So this is, this is the nebula, the, the initial nebula before it collapsed, before it began spinning and all, all the rest of it. It was just slowly, slowly turning in space, this formless cloud of gas and dust, and it would have been ever so slowly turning. Now, one day, about four and a half billion years ago, it began to collapse inward on itself. And as it collapsed inward, the, the, the core of the nebula, the core of the gas cloud grew, well, it grew more massive, had more matter in there, it grew more massive, its gravitational field increased because bigger things have bigger gravitational fields. Also, I should say more massive things have more gravitational pull. So it pulled in more gas, got more massive, 
they've pulled in more gas, got more massive. And once it reaches this point, there's no going back. It's runaway collapse. And as it collapsed, it began spinning up and it flattened out into a disk. And eventually in the center of the disk, enough matter coalesced that nuclear fusion was possible in the core and it flickered to light and we had the birth of the sun. The sun flooded the light with solar system for the first time. But back then, the solar system was nothing like it is today. It was pretty much mostly made of gas. And the disk that was surrounding the young sun was made almost entirely of gas with just a small smattering of dust that it inherited from the dust cloud, from, from the nebula. Now, as this gas orbited the sun, it began to cool down. And as it began to cool, the, the atoms and the molecules in the gas in the disk, they began to, they began to click together to form well, to form minerals. Now, this is, this is where I think things get really interesting because these minerals are the first rocks to form in the solar system. So we've gone from gas to minute dust-sized pieces of rock, these tiny flecks of mineral. And these tiny minerals orbited the sun along with the rest of the gas in the disk with the sun at the center. Now, these, these motes of dust were really, really tiny. And I can personally attest to this because it's these motes of dust that I studied for five years. And in fact, you need a microscope to see most of them. But they didn't stay small for long. They eventually started to stick together. You got little tiny clump, you got little tiny motes of dust that stuck together to form tiny clumps of dust. And then these tiny clumps of dust stuck together to form even bigger clumps. And then these even bigger clumps stuck together to form even bigger clumps. A little bit like a dust bunny when you haven't vacuumed underneath your sofa or your bed for too long. They, as they orbited the sun, they, they started to stick together to form bigger and bigger bodies. Until eventually, size. These are called the planetesimals, and they're the, they're the ancestors of the planets, if you like, because these planetesimals themselves stuck together to form what we call planetary embryos. Now, there are still a couple of planetary embryos left in the solar system. Mars, actually, some, some planetary scientists consider Mars to be a planetary embryo because it's so small, but certainly some of the large asteroids in the, in the asteroid belt, uh, they're, a little, uh, they're way bigger than most other asteroids, and I'll come on to that in a minute, but we, we consider them to be planetary embryos as well. And as the name suggests, the planetary embryos were the ancestors of the planets, because if these planetary embryos, if enough of them stuck together, you end up with just a few bodies in the solar system containing almost all of the matter. And that's the origin of the planets. And as the planets, as the planets orbited the sun, they swept up the remaining debris that was in the disk to form the nice clockwork clean solar system that we see today. It's like a jewel with its crown. It's like a crown with its jewel stuck in it. But the beady-eyed amongst you who are paying attention will, will see on my cartoon that actually this process of, of having all the debris hoovered up by the planets didn't occur everywhere. And that is the famous asteroid belt. Now the asteroid belt is this, and, and I'm sure some of you listening will have seen asteroids as well through, through your own telescopes. These, these things started to be discovered in the early 1800s, which incidentally was almost exactly the same time that meteorites became, became accepted as, as a credible source of scientific inquiry. And it, it turns out, and it, it, it's, it sort of slowly transpired over the next 150 years or so, and it was in the mid-1900s that we realized, oh my gosh, meteorites come from the asteroid belt. And I'll talk a little bit more about that too. And the reason these asteroids never clumped together to form a planet is because of the gravitational influence of Jupiter. Um, the gravitational resonance with Jupiter prevented these bodies from clumping together to form a large planet. So they've remained this band of solitary wanderers since the solar system formed four and a half billion years ago. And these are some of the first asteroids to be discovered with the moon behind them for scale. So, you know, they're not that big. And even the largest Ceres, which is the largest asteroid by far, is only about the size of the British Isles. You could, you could, you could I guess you could drive it in a day from one pole to the other. Um, I mean, yeah, you could drive it in a day pretty much. So even Ceres, the biggest asteroid, is quite small. And certainly compared to planets like the Earth, Asteroids are absolutely tiny. Even the largest are just the size of small to medium-sized countries. Um, and for most, of, for most of the time that we've known of asteroids, which is we've known about, you know, the, at least the biggest asteroids for at least 150 years now. Um, for most of our time, they, they, just, they just look like 
points of light in the sky. In fact, that, that's where the word asteroid comes from. Asteroid, it means star-like. And that's because they've got some star-like properties in that they're point sources of light in the sky. But they're not quite like stars either because they seem to be in orbit around the sun. And actually, you, you can watch them over the course of the night. Some of them, they're, they're, they're quite irregularly shaped. And as they tumble, as they spin in their orbit, you can see their, you can see their um, brightness changing throughout the night. So they're, they're star-like. It was actually Herschel who coined that term, which is kind of cool. One, we can add that to the list of things that Herschel did. Um, but nowadays, we know the asteroids, in at least some of them, in, in beautiful detail. And this is my favorite asteroid, Vesta. It's the second biggest asteroid in the asteroid belt. And NASA's Dawn mission explored it for, for, for about a year. Um, I think it was in 2012 Dawn was around Vesta before it then took off to explore Ceres. And one of the things you'll notice about Vesta, and this is true for all of the other asteroids, is that they're absolutely peppered in impact craters. These, these holes you can see in them, the, there are three just there on the right hand side. And if you sort of tilt your head 90 degrees, um, it looks like a snowman. And, and those craters are affectionately known as the snowman, which is kind of cool that planetary scientists also have senses of humor. And, and whatever scale you look at these asteroids, they're absolutely covered in craters, right from, from you know, city-sized craters all the way to minute craters that are at the resolution of the, satellite, of the space probes that we send to explore them. And it's these craters that are the source of the meteorites. Every now and again, you'll get a stray rock that plows into the surface of one of these asteroids. And the energy deposited into the surface of these asteroids blasts out material into outer space. It leaves behind a hole, which is the crater. And some of that material, if it's traveling fast enough, will get ejected completely from the asteroid's gravitational field. And some of it will make its way to the Earth. And when they fall, they fall as spectacular meteors or fireballs. Um, or shooting stars, as they're more probably romantically known, but they're all really the same thing. Fireballs are big meteors, and meteors are the same as shooting stars. And this is this is one of the Italian Dolomites that a photographer called Ollie Taylor took. He gave me permission to use this, which was very kind of him. Um, he got it completely by chance because they fall essentially at random at all times of the year, at all times of the day, with a slight preference for the for the um, for the dusk and the dawn. And and um, so there's no predicting a photograph like this. It was just immense luck. And the same is true for seeing one fall as well. You've, you've probably all seen shooting stars and fireballs, but I'm guessing, although I'd love, to be, I'd love to be told I'm wrong, I'm guessing nobody has ever seen one and then gone over to the site, the scene of the fall and found the rock. Um, that would be incredibly lucky. And there have only been about 20 recorded instances of that happening in the UK ever. So um, the next person to see one falling and finding it, you, you'd, be, you'd be famous. You'd probably be most read on BBC News and um, I'll be calling you up all very excited. Now in the worldwide collection, we have about 60,000 meteorites. And that's, 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 that's a lot of meteorites, right? 60,000 meteorites, which, which is, it's even more surprising when you consider what the earth looks like. It's mostly covered in water. And because, because meteorites fall essentially randomly all over the surface of the earth, although there is a slight preference for the equator, but it's essentially random all over the earth. Most of meteorites just fall into the ocean and we will never know about them. They're lost forever. Um, but yet we have 60,000 and almost all of those, well, in fact, that's about two thirds of those come from Antarctica, the giant, the giant ice mass you can see at the bottom of the screen there, somewhat exaggerated in size because of the projection that this image is on. Um, most of them come from Antarctica, in part because they stand out on the white snow and meteorites are generally black when they fall because they're, they're essentially set on fire as they fall through the atmosphere. And a lot of them also come from the Sahara Desert as well because they stand out on the sand. Now, from the meteorites, we've learned a great deal about the asteroids from which they originate. And so the, the geological character and the, the geochemical character of the meteorites is really, it's all about the geological character of the asteroids from which they originate. And by looking at the meteorites, we've, 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 we've turned the asteroids from just you know, points of light in the sky that Herschel and his contemporaries would have looked at into, into, into worlds in their own right with their own geological history and their own story to tell. And in studying meteorites, so this is, this is a little bit of science here, we, we can split meteorites into two main families. On one hand, we've got the chondrites. Some of you might have heard that word, and I'm gonna talk about the chondrites a lot in, in five minutes or so. We've got the chondrites on one hand, and the achondrites on the other hand. Now, the two main families of, of, of meteorite, they reflect the two main family of asteroids, because the chondrites, come from asteroids that never melted 
and the achondrites come from asteroids that melted. And melting is one of the most destructive of all geological forces. It, it pretty much completely rewrites a rock's geological character. And so that's why we divide the meteorites into the, the unmolten chondrites and the molten achondrites. And I'm going to talk about the achondrites first because they are wonderful, wonderful rocks. And from them, we've learned a great deal about the internal structure of the asteroids from which they originate. So initially when these asteroids formed, they were, they were pretty much homogenous all the way through because they were just these vast collections of these microscopic motes of dust that coalesced to form them in the first place. Now, some of these asteroids got rather hot and when you heat rock up enough, it, it melts. And when these asteroids melted, they segregated into two main portions. The first portion was in the center. This is the core of the asteroid. Now, the core of the asteroid was mostly made of iron and nickel, which will give you a clue as to where we're going with this. And the iron and nickel, because it was quite dense, it sank down in, in almost like miniature droplets. It rained down through the interior of the asteroid because it's really dense and it pooled, it collected in the center of these asteroids to form a giant metallic blob. And this giant metallic blob over the, over the next hundred million years or so cooled and crystallized to form a giant sphere of metallic iron nickel in the center of these bodies. And that's where the iron meteorites come from. Now left behind when the core formed was the layer that you can see on this image, which is sort of the orangey layer. That's the mantle of these asteroids. And that's what we call the stony portion of the asteroid. Because if you went and sampled a piece of this mantle, it would look, well, it would look like a stone, like we might recognize on the earth. Whereas the, the iron meteorites, are, although they are still technically rocks, we don't describe them as stony because they're made of metallic minerals, which are rather strange. Now, one of the ways, well, in fact, pretty much the only way that a planet loses heat to space is through volcanism. That's why the Earth's volcanically active. You know, geology on Earth only really happens because the Earth is cooling down. Geology is just a consequence of the Earth trying to get rid of its heat into space. These asteroids were no different. And on the surface of these asteroids, we have volcanoes. And they would have spewed their lava high into the air. Well, very high into the air because these worlds were not big. They didn't have strong gravitational fields. So the lava fountains, God, what I would give to go back and see that. And it carpeted the surface of these asteroids in, in a thick layer of magma of, of lava and this lava would have crept across the surface like like a, like a carpet you know like you see in hawaii the carpets of molten rock creeping across the roads and down the hillsides it would have resembled something like that and so we have these three distinct layers in these asteroids we have the rocky crust we have the rocky mantle and then in the center we have the metallic core and the metallic cores, as I said, they're the source of the iron meteorites. And this is me in my laboratory in when I was a PhD student in Bristol at the university there um, with a large lump of iron meteorites, giving it a little bit of chemical treatment to bring out the crystal structure inside the stone. Now, just there, I'm brushing on a, a, a mixture of alcohol yeah, alcohol and nitric acid with a paintbrush from Wilco's. And by doing that, it's a process called etching. And I dissolve the minerals inside the meteorite to different degrees and they come out slightly different colors. So you can just see there on the video now, it's the, the minerals are just starting to come out. That sort of those finger sized crystals that are interlocking. That's called a Widmanstatin pattern. And there's a really nice rule of thumb in geology, which is the larger a crystal is in a rock generally, the longer that rock took to cool down. And because the, the minerals, the, the, the crystals in an iron meteorites are so big, this is an indication that they took really long to cool. And the only place really you get such slow cooling rates on these asteroids is the core, because the core is insulated by the blanket of rock overhead. So they took you know, 100 million years to cool down, during which time these crystals grew immense. Now the stony meteorites, these are the stony iron meteorites rather. I think, I think, I think I'm okay saying this because I've seen a lot of rocks in my time. I think these are the most beautiful rocks in nature. Um, this particular type of stony iron meteorite, some of you might know it as a palisite. They're just one type of stony iron meteorite. And the stony iron meteorites, they're kind of a hybrid between the metallic meteorites, the metallic portion of the asteroid and the rocky portion of the asteroid. So this, this one here is made of giant, so this, just for reference, the size of that slice of meteorite is about the size of an iPhone. And so these, these giant sort of bottle green crystals you can see in this rock are a mineral that, well, 
we, we Cosmo chemists call it Mg2SiO4, geologists call it olivine, but it's colloquially known as peridot, which is a, a lovely semi-precious gem that's used quite often in jewellery, and it's quite popular, or it was quite popular amongst the Austrian aristocracy, and the equivalent of the crown jewels of Austria are actually made of peridot as well, so it really is a semi-precious gem that we find in these meteorites. These giant sort of penny-sized bottle green olivine grains, these peridot grains, surrounded by a sort of a matrix of, of, of metal. And the wonderful thing is, is that when you slice these meteorites rather thin, you can shine light through them. And the metal doesn't allow the light to shine through, but the olivine does, and so they, they glow just beautiful. And I, I just can't believe that nature managed to craft something like that. I, we would never have done that ourselves. It's just, it's wonderful. But the beauty of the palisites really masks their quite calamitous origin. It was once thought that the palisites originated from the very bottom of the mantle. So we've got the core and the mantle and the boundary between them. Some people thought that this was where the palisites came from. It turns out that's probably not true, actually. And I do go into some detail about this in my book. It turns out that the most likely way that the palisites formed was from the collision of two asteroids and the molten metallic core of one of those asteroids was injected into the rocky portion of the other and so almost like like white hot molten iron metallic fingers this this molten metal from the core of one asteroid was injected and it surrounded the olivine grains in the mantle of the other asteroid and they eventually cooled to form this sort of frankenstein combination of two asteroids in these meteorites and so, you know, it's a kind of nice lesson that even the, the beauty of a rock can really mask quite violent origin. Now, that's enough about the achondrites, which originate from molten asteroids. So let's put those to one side for a second and look at the other major family of meteorites, the chondrites. Now, the chondrites, they come from asteroids that never melted. And because they never melted, these asteroids preserve the dust from which the asteroids, and by extension, the planets, initially coalesced. And so by studying the chondrites, which is my particular area of expertise, by studying the chondrites, we learn not just about the history of the asteroids, but we learn about the history of the nebula phase of the solar system's lifetime. And just to, just to, just to run through this scenario again, so this is, this is sort of a zoomed in version of what it might have looked like in the disk. We've got, we've got countless numbers of minute flecks of dust. Most of them, you know, the, these, these dust grains, you know, when you've got a, a, a loaf of seeded bread, and when you finish the loaf, there's all the breadcrumbs and the poppy seeds and the odd sunflower seed in the bottom of the bag. That's about the, the sort of coarseness of this dust. It, it would have been most of it poppy seed sized, minute fragments of bread, sort of like that, if you can picture it. And in the nebula, in the protoplanetary disk, these, oh, I've clicked off my, there we go. These, these motes of dust began to coalesce in countless numbers to form worlds, to form asteroids. And while these asteroids did get slightly warm, they never melted. And so the dust is still preserved to this day. And we have also got up close and personal with some of these asteroids too. Um, this is the asteroid Bennu, which is going to be in the news quite a lot um, in, the next, in the next couple of years, undoubtedly, because Bennu is the subject of an ongoing NASA mission called OSIRIS-REx. And a couple of years ago, Osiris Rex launched from, from I think it was, I think it was Florida, I think it was the Kennedy Space Center. Um, Osiris, Osiris Rex launched, it flew to Bennu through interplanetary space, and it's now in orbit around Bennu and has been for quite a while, imaging the surface in brilliant detail. Um, and it's actually going to scoop up pieces of this asteroid and bring them back to the Earth, which is super exciting. And and in a funny kind of way, we already know what to expect. Bennu is far too small to ever have melted. And in fact, the, the properties of its surface indicate that it never melted. And so it's one of these asteroids from which chondrite meteorites come from. And we have lots of chondrites on the Earth. And so we can, we can at least make some pretty good guesses of what we're going to get from Bennu when pieces are brought back, because we already have pieces of asteroids like it on the Earth. And this is, this is what these these meteorites look like up close. And each of the individual motes, you can see, you can see that different types, different shapes, different colors. Um, this, this really reflects the diversity of different dust types in the protoplanetary disk. There were, there were hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of different types of dust that formed, some more common than others, that all coalesced to form the asteroids and the planets. 
and they go right up from the largest ones are probably about the size of a garden pea. They're certainly the largest ones that I've seen personally and read about in the literature, but they go all the way down to you really need a scanning electron microscope to see them. So it's this great mishmash of different dust types that all go together to form the meteorites that come from unmolten asteroids. And that's a picture of me with one of them. And because these, because these, and I actually have that chunk of meteorite in the in the laboratory, the beakers that I showed you at the start of my talk, there's a piece of that meteorite in those beakers. That was a meteorite called Allende, which some of you might have heard of. It's probably the most studied rock in the whole of science. Um, I can talk about that afterwards if you want. But the, the point is that the chondrites, because they contain the dust from which the solar system coalesced and the asteroids coalesced, and by extension, the planets and the comets coalesced, they can take us back into the protoplanetary disk phase of the solar system's evolution, which is way further back in time than any Earth rock can possibly take us. Because like all the other planets and many other asteroids, the Earth melted and therefore destroyed the dust from which it was originally coalesced. So thank goodness for the chondrites. And this is another piece of the same meteorite with a, with a 20 pence for scale. And I actually bought this, this slice of meteorite from a really, a really great meteorite dealer. And it was a few hundred quid. I didn't buy it myself. It belongs to the university. But, and I have to mention this, I put this picture on Twitter a few weeks ago. And apparently the 20 pences that were made in 1982 were quite valuable. And it turns out that that 20 pence is more valuable than the slice of meteorite. So go and check your wallets and your purses after the talk. If you've got a 20 pence that's from 1982, sell it and buy yourself a slice of IND. Because it's got wonderful things inside it. And you can, you can see just from this picture, there are lots and lots of different dust types. Probably the one that jumps out the most is the dust type in the top right hand corner. That it sort of looks a bit like, I don't know, it looks a bit like bird mess on your car windscreen to be crude, or maybe chewing gum, if I'm going to be more polite about it, that someone's just sort of stuck on the underside of a table or something. It turns out that these strange looking objects, these sort of white, fluffy, irregularly shaped objects, are, they're, they're probably. I don't know, can I say? Yeah, they're one of the most interesting things in the whole of space science. They're called CAIs, which stands for calcium aluminium rich inclusion. And as the name suggests, these objects are incredibly rich in calcium and aluminium. In fact, they're almost entirely made of calcium oxide and aluminium oxide in, in, in various different combinations. They're very rich in calcium and aluminium minerals. And they were first discovered in, in 1968 by a French, a French meteoriticist called Mireille Christophe Michel Levy. And apologies for any French speakers in the audience, I completely butchered that um, pronunciation. But I, I do talk about her in my book because she, she was the first person to, to, to describe formally CAIs in a meteorite. And, and she noted in, in this paper in, in 1968, which, which I read with the help of Google Translate because it's in French, um, she, she noted that the, the, she was very good at thermodynamics and she, she noted that the combination of minerals and the combination of elements in these CAIs could only really form under very special conditions. One of those conditions is very low pressure and another condition is very high temperature, which is a bit of a head scratcher because there aren't many places or at least there aren't many obvious places. And just, just keep in mind, this was in 1968. So this was, this was way before we knew almost all of what we know now about meteorites. We, comparatively, we didn't, know, we didn't know much about meteorites back then. So she really, really was ahead of her time writing this paper. She noted that the, these strange conditions, low pressure, high temperature, that the CAIs formed under. Now, Mirel. Christophe Michel Levy, she, she only had quite comparative, comparatively rudimentary kit to look at these CAIs. She had optical microscopes and, you know, sophisticated chemistry kit for the time, but nothing like what we've got today. Now we see CAIs like this. This is, a, this is an image that I took of that very piece of meteorite. Um, this is a CAI that I took using a scanning electron microscope, which, which the likes of the, you know, the French cosmochemists in the 60s could only have ever dreamed of. Um, this is what we call an X-ray map. And it's kind of similar to the, the analysis of King Tutankhamun's dagger that I mentioned at the start of the talk. Scanning electron microscope, you, you fire a beam of very tightly controlled electrons at your rock. And when you fire electrons at a rock, it begins to give out X-rays and the colors 
or rather the, the wavelengths or the energies of those x-rays, you can use them to calculate the abundance of elements at each point on the surface. And by doing that for each point on the surface, you can, you can make an image. And um, so this, this is what we call an element map. And it's a map of how the elements vary across the surface of a sample. And then I false colored them and combined them. And you can see from this image, calcium and aluminium, they're red and blue respectively. And so the, the giant CAI in the center there is mostly red and blue. So it's a smoking gun that it's a CAI. And Mike um, Mirelle Christophe Michel Levy, she predicted that the CAIs must have formed next to the sun when the solar system was forming four and a half billion years ago. And the reason she thought that was because it's the only real place in the solar system that, that, that really fits the bill. It's low, low pressure because it's essentially the vacuum of outer space and it's incredibly high temperatures. You know, it was almost 2000 degrees C and the only real place where you get sustained temperatures like that in outer space is right next to the sun. And it turns out that she was almost certainly exactly right. By far the most popular hypothesis for the origin of CIIs today is that they formed right next to the new sun. And when they formed, they were blown backwards into the rest of the solar system along stellar winds where they settled back down to the disk plane and got incorporated into the asteroids and ultimately the planets. And so these CIIs, they're, they're that I, I almost like to think of them as little pieces of sun snow. They would have, they would have looked like flecks of snow, white snow crystallizing out of, of thin air in the protoplanetary disk as the solar system was forming. But the place where CIIs formed is just the beginning of what CIIs can tell us because, and I, I'm saying this as a chronologist, so my, my particular area of research for the last five years has been, the, has been dating meteorites. And it turns out that of the CIIs that have been dated, they're the oldest things that we've ever dated and they are precisely 4.567 billion years old and for those who, who want the number exactly it's 4 billion 567 million 300 thousand years give or take 160 thousand years which is which is actually not you know if you think think about the the precision on that measurement for a second 160 thousand years sounds like a long time it's actually less time than humans have been around on planet earth and we've managed to date minute pieces of rock that are for over four and a half billion years old to within a few hundred thousand years, um, which is a real testament to the power of modern science. It's just absolutely wonderful. And, you know, hopefully one of the things that, that, I've, that I've got across is that when we talk about the age of the solar system, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. How old is the solar system? Well, it kind of depends what you mean by the age of the solar system, because as I said at the start of the talk, and we've certainly learned from meteorites and astronomical observations is that, Solar system formation is a process rather than an event. It takes a few million years. So where do we draw the line between before and after? Well, in truth, that line is, is somewhat arbitrary, actually. But the CAIs provide us with a really convenient place to start the beginning of the solar system because all of the CAIs that have been dated, they have the same age. So it seems that all the CAIs formed at the same time and they're the oldest things. So they're a really natural choice that we use to define the age of the solar system. And I kind of like that because the word solar comes from, you know, it comes from the Latin sol meaning sun. It's a sun system that we live in. You know, we like to think it's a planetary system, but it's not really because most of the solar system is the sun. It's a sun system, yet we date it using rocks, which really pleases the geologist in me. And this is, this is a picture of me, um, not dating CAIs, but dating stuff that are just about as old as CAIs. Um, some of the other minute pieces of dust in chondrites and that was taken just just before christmas last year um, that was a really a really great experiment so there we have it the cais so four and a half billion years all this happened now i've thought about this number and thought about this number every single day for the last five years and i, I work with this number i measure rocks i measure the age of rocks that are about as old as cais all the time and yet it still really doesn't mean anything to me as 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 animals that have, that have only really been designed to think about, well, I don't know. I've, I think I very rarely seriously live life longer than a few months in the future. After that, it sort of all bets are off because I guess certainly for a 27 year old trying to find my way in the world a little bit, life's just too unpredictable to think about things further than at least a year in the future because all bets are off, anything could happen, right? But I think at most, we're probably only designed to think about the future in a few years, maybe. Certainly, probably on a few year scale. But after that, 
the world's just too chaotic to predict. So we, we, we just simply cannot, and you'll be used to this as people that are into astronomy, you can't comprehend deep time and astronomical distances and, and stellar masses. It's all a bit beyond us. But to try and at least give us a glimpse into what four and a half billion years looks like, we can shrink that four and a half billion years down to a 24 hour day and look at when different events happened in Earth's history. So if we formed the CAIs four and a half billion years ago, start the clock ticking at midnight, life, well actually life came about pretty quickly. It was about three hours into the day. Um, and I've put ish there because it's not exactly certain if the first evidence for life was actually life. Um, it's, it's contentious, but probably by about three hours into the day, life had originally And the amount of time it took to go from the origin of life-ish to something like a fish was immense. Fish didn't come about until 20 minutes past nine in the evening. So the day's almost over, even by the time we get to fish. So, you know, fish, they've been around for a long time. It's, it's I don't know, call it, call it half a billion years, something like that. They, they haven't been around for a long time at all compared to the Earth's history and the age of CAIs. Trees have only been around for about two hours. They came just after the clock had struck in 10. Dinosaurs that we think of as these really sort of ancient animals that, that stalked the land way back in geological time, in ancient times. It was 225 million years ago that the dinosaurs were around. On the scale of the solar system time, it's nothing. It was only an hour and 10 minutes ago. And the dinosaurs, they were only around for about 50 50 minutes before they went extinct by a giant asteroid collision with the earth which there's also a huge chapter in my book about asteroid collisions because that's um, it's unbelievable this i won't go into it now i'll digress maybe another time i can do a talk on that the dinosaurs went extinct about 20 minutes ago so you know we say oh the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago and the cretaceous period ended it's so long ago. It's not really. It's only 20 minutes ago in a 24-hour day. And that says nothing for our own species. We've only been around for four seconds. Modern humans, you know, call it 200,000 years, something like that, that modern humans have been around. That equates to about four seconds in a 24-hour day compared to the age of CAIs. And that says nothing about writing. Okay, we've only been writing things down for 0.1 of a second. So, and that's the entirety of recorded human history with the exception of the occasional cave painting, but certainly, certainly recorded history in the form of words and numbers. All that is squeezed down into one tenth of one second of a 24 hour day when you look at the scale of the solar system and the time that it's existed, which, and I think quite poetically, is about the time it takes to blink. So we've only been writing things down for the literal blink of an eye in a 24 hour day. And this, this is, for me, certainly cause for optimism, actually, because another thing that we invented not too long ago is the scientific method. And I mean, it's, it's contentious when we first started doing science, but call it, I don't know, use the Renaissance, that's what I use for this calculation, something like that, the Enlightenment. We've only been doing it for a hundredth of a second. And so what amazes me about science is, is not how long we've been doing it, it's for little we've been doing it just think what we've managed to achieve in that one hundredth of one second we've gone from we've gone from just about being able to calculate the orbits of the planets um because i guess all science really at least modern science really started with astronomy he started with you know predicting the motions of the stars and the planets across the heavens we've, we've gone from doing that to landing people on the moon constructing the periodic table, you know, the, the 92 elemental building blocks from which basically everything on Earth is made of. We've got beautiful, beautiful space telescopes up there, meticulously crafted to peer, you know, a pinprick of an area in the night sky. One thousandth of that, we've got images of that, that appear in billions of years back in time, back to the first galaxies. We've, 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 you know, we've discovered the genetic code. We've done so much in science in such a small amount of time. And so while the world sometimes seems to be going to hell pretty fast, the progress that we humans have made using the scientific method in that short amount of time really gives me hope of what's possible in the world. And so just don't forget that one hundredth of a second when things seem pretty bleak for us, because I don't think we're actually that bad. Um, we have our faults as a species, but on the whole, we've done some pretty remarkable things. And science is a really nice exemplar of that. Now, meteorites, I've, you know, I've spoken a lot about meteorites and, and deep time and asteroids that they come from. But, 
But meteorites, they tell of a story that's a little more intimately connected with us as well. And there's a very rare type of meteorite called carbonaceous chondrites. And there aren't many carbonaceous chondrites. And there are even fewer carbonaceous chondrites that contain it. Now, one of them fell in 1969 in Murchison in Australia. Some of you might be nodding your heads because you've probably heard of this meteorite. And the strange thing about the Murchison meteorite is that it smelled when it landed. It smelled, and I can personally say this is true because I've smelled a piece of Murchison and other meteorites like it. They sort of smell like a cross between paint stripper and wet dog. Or if you've, if you've left your towel, if there are any students listening, you'll know what I'm on about. When you leave your towel a little too long without washing it when you're an undergraduate and you haven't quite got the hang of washing um, regularly, the towel goes a bit musty. That's kind of what they smell like. It's kind of disgusting. And the smell coming from the rocks is a medley of organic compounds inside the meteorite. And I'm, I'm not just talking about simple organic compounds here. I'm talking about really complex organic compounds. You know, we go from everything from really simple ones right down to just a few carbon atoms with a few little twigs sticking off right up to atom, right up to molecules that are hundreds of atoms big and everything in between. And, and amongst this, this chemical medley, this organic sort of froth that's inside these meteorites are amino acids. And amino acids are the building blocks of proteins and proteins are the building blocks of life on Earth as we know it. Now, I don't want you to go away from this talk thinking, oh gosh, we've never mind Venus and phosphate and we've discovered, we've discovered life in meteorites long ago. There is no evidence for extraterrestrial life, well, anywhere, um, no compelling evidence anywhere, but certainly not in meteorites, but the building blocks of life do exist in meteorites. And there's a hypothesis that's taken quite seriously and it's, 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 quite, a, it's quite a large area of research this and it's, it's under some scrutiny and the, the case is I could, I could be swayed. The hypothesis is that, that after the Earth formed and most of the violence of, Earth, of planet formation and the Earth had cooled off a little bit, that the molecules of life, the precursors to life, were delivered to the surface of the Earth on board these carbonaceous meteorites. And it's this material from which life originated. And so by looking at the carbonaceous chondrites, we're not just looking at the, the, you know, the dusty building blocks of planets and the history of the planets and the solar system we're potentially also looking at the history of life on Earth, which is, of course, part of our own history as well. And moreover, we also find a very familiar molecule in these meteorites too, water, H2O. Now, you can't wring these meteorites out like, like flannels and sponges. The, the water is bound up in minerals. But if you, heat, if you heat the meteorites, they dehydrate and they actually give off water. And the, you, know, there's a, there's, you heard it get said a lot that maybe Earth's water was delivered from comets which is, which is it's a good idea because comets are very water rich, but it turns out that the, the precise blend of isotopes in comets, particularly hydrogen, is nothing like the blend of isotopes in earthly water. But it turns out that the, the isotopic composition of the water in carbonaceous chondrites is very, very similar. In fact, it's, it's basically identical for some of them to the Earth's water, which further lends evidence to this idea that the carbonaceous chondrites, they rained down the organic matter and the water, which, which eventually became Earth's ocean and life on Earth. And if that's true, then the carbonaceous chondrites are our prebiotic ancestors that fell from the sky onto the surface of the early Earth, which I just think is, is, is if that's one of the, possibly one of the most wonderful things that we've ever discovered. You know, these, these, these stones that have captivated us for thousands of years and we, you know, we're, we're so lucky that we live in a society now where you know, we've got so many problems in the world, but a very, very, very thin sliver of government money goes towards doing curiosity-led science. And a very small slither of that money goes towards studying meteorites. And we've discovered all these amazing things just from studying these rocks that fall from the sky. And um, it turns out that, that part of the tale that we've unpicked might eventually lead back to our own origins from meteorites falling to the earth. And so with that, I will showed you um my my book trailer because in 2020 books have trailers and here it was me thinking that just films had trailers but my publisher of, of my new book meteorite uh, you won't believe how long it took to come up with that title meteorite the stones from outer space that made our world um, my publisher john murray they made a trailer so i'm going to show it to you now and the trailer didn't come with any sound but since i have a microphone 
Um, and and I've, I've got the stage, as it were. I'm going to read the trailer to you live. So here we go. So every rock has a story to tell. But there is a limit to how far back in time earthly rocks can take us. To unpick the story of how our home planet and the rest of the solar system came to be, we need a rock not from beneath our feet, but one that fell from outer space. We need a meteorite. And that is the title of my new book, which covers, which covers a, a bit of what I've spoken about. Well, it covers all of what I've spoken about today, but there's, there's, there's so much more as well. Um, I could speak for 20 hours <laughs> on this subject because there's so much amazing stuff. And actually one of the hardest bits about writing meteorite was um, deciding what not to put in. Maybe I'll do another one one day with all the bits that didn't go in. Um, this is a, a book that I, that I wrote for people who, who have absolutely no background in science. Um, you, can, you can enjoy and understand and, and, and maybe even take something away from this book um, if you don't have an interest in science, but there's also some quite detailed things in there for people who have a bit of background knowledge and well, and for the, the keen beans who want to delve a little deeper into meteorite science. And um, it's available now from your favorite bookshop. And I was lucky enough as well to record the audio myself so if you want to hear a Yorkshire accent reading a book about meteorites, then you can pick up the audio version as well. And with that, I will thank you so much for listening. And again, I really mean it. I'm the, the thing that I feel the most when I, when I, when I give talks to societies and the public or, or, or talks to anywhere, really, the, the overwhelming feeling is gratitude. So thank you so much for choosing to spend your Saturday afternoon with us to hear about meteorites. I'd be happy to stay around for however long is needed to answer any questions or point people towards some answers if I don't have the questions to hand. Um, thank you very much for listening to my talk. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Tim. That was, a, that was really great. Could you stop sharing your screen and then we can see? No problem. Every, there we go. It was very there nice, great, but uh, um, <laughs> that's, uh, we have, thanks very much, and that was a really super talk, and I'm sure Thank everybody you. really enjoyed that. Nice, nice to see some graphics other than the, uh, the, the, what I tend to do, and leave a slide on screen for about the th five minutes, <laughs> which is uh, uh, not really the way to do it. Um, now, Dave, tell me, we, I know we've got some questions and answers. Can we, can we type those on screens, or do you want me to read them out? Uh, we we we'll need to read them out, really. Um, okay. Yeah, I can't right. copy them into the chat, so. No, okay, right. Now, one from Angie Jones. He says, I have a meteorite collection, which I use at school to show the pupils. They often find it hard to believe that they are meteorites. Is there any way to tell that they are meteorites without having to chop them in half for the metallic ones or treating their ends with concentrated nitric acid, presumably the meteorites and not the school children? Well, Andy, that, that, sounds, that sounds wonderful. And I, I totally resonate with taking rocks into schools because often it's little kids who are really, really, really interested in rocks. And I've, in my experience, basically every young kid is interested in rocks. So good on you for going into schools and, and, and showing this to young people. I would have loved that as a young kid. In fact, I would still have loved it now. So that's really cool that you do that. So your question, is there a way to tell they are meteorites without having to chop them in half for the metallic ones and treating their ends with concentrated nitric acid? That's a really great question, and I'm going to answer it in two parts. So first of all, the metallic meteorites. No, there isn't a way to tell that they're meteorites just, just by looking at them, unless you see one falling. So you know it's come from space, and then you pick it up and show it to somebody. And, and maybe they won't believe you, so maybe they wouldn't even believe it if they showed you. But a really nice way to think about it and to put it is that where else do you find metallic rocks on the surface of the Earth? Nowhere is the answer. And that's because of the Earth's oxygen rich atmosphere. If you get any metal on the Earth's surface, it, it, it well, anyone who's left a car out, anyone who's got an old car, right? It, it starts to rust. And that's because the oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere, it loves to snap onto other chemicals like iron and turn them into rust. And so if there's any metallic iron that gets formed on the Earth naturally, um, or at least by by earthly means, by geological means, it will very, very quickly turn to rust and disappear, which is why we don't find pure iron on the earth, really. I mean, we, we do in some very, very rare geological settings, but it's basically unheard of to get pure metals on the earth's surface because they just rust so quickly. Whereas the iron meteorites are completely alien 
um, which is they're probably the meteorites that it's most obvious that they are extraterrestrial because they literally do look alien because where else do you find lumps of metal on the Earth's surface? Pretty much nowhere. Um, but, but barring that, it's a little expensive, but you can measure the chemical composition of these rocks and they're unlike anything that you find on the Earth. In fact, it was the iron meteorites that were really a smoking gun that meteorites really do come from space. In, in 1802, an English chemist by the name of, of Edward Howard he measured the precise chemical composition of iron meteorites and found that they were very rich in an element called nickel, which you, you've probably heard of actually, it's quite a common mineral, but it's not common in rocks. You only tend to find it, you know, sub percent level if you're lucky. Nickel is, is very dilute on the earth, if you like. It's spread very thinly, but in iron meteorites, it can be up to 10% nickel, which is essentially unheard of on the earth, which is one of the original smoking gun pieces of evidence that meteorites are not an earthly product. They're made by something else entirely and so come from space. Now, as for the other, as for the other types of meteorites, the stony meteorites, there's, unless you've got a trained eye and you've looked at them for many years, like I have, I guess, that they, they, they don't look at all remarkable. They do just look like rocks. And I, I know that I'm biased because I'm a geologist by training and I, like I love rocks, but, but they do just look like rocks, right? So it's really difficult to to convincingly prove that they are meteorites. One of the only telltale signs, at least physically visible signs, that, that meteorites are not quite like normal rocks is the fusion crust that you get on the surface of meteorites. Now the fusion crust, that forms when these rocks plummet through the atmosphere. And as they plummet through the atmosphere as shooting stars, they glow incandescent. Um, it's a bit of a misconception as to why they glow. A lot of people think it's the friction with the air, but it's not actually. It's the compression of the air in front of them in the bow shock. If you imagine a ship plowing through the ocean and, and parting the waves as it goes, that pressure wave, it, it heats the water up ever so slightly. And it also eats, heats the air up as the meteorite plows through the atmosphere. And it's this pressurization of the air in the bow of the meteorite that heats the air up and causes it to glow. It's a little bit like pumping a bicycle pump up. As, as you compress a gas, it gets hotter. It's exactly the same as that. Anyway, as these meteorites fall, they get very hot. And so their surfaces partially melt and vaporize. And then when they slow down enough, just before they land, the, the surface quenches to form a glass a black glass on the surface of the meteorites that we call the fusion crust. And you don't really get that forming on any sort of earth rock. Maybe some volcanic rocks, you get something similar forming. But the only real way that you can get a fusion crust forming around a rock is from a meteorite. So that's another telltale sign. But it's, it's a really interesting question. And it's, it's somewhat disappointing. I'd love to be able to say, you know, if you shine this type of light on a meteorite, it, it starts to glow this color, which is some magical property of space rocks but it's just not the case in, in they are just rocks and their their chemical quirks are hidden by their their appearance if you like um to a, to a trained eye there are peculiarities that are inconsistent with an earthly origin but but for for all intents and purposes they're they're mineralogically identical to earth rocks and they only really begin to reveal themselves as particularly strange when you delve into their chemistry and their precise mineralogy and their age, which unfortunately is quite expensive for a classroom. So um, I don't know, but it's kind of good that they don't believe you. We need more <laughs> skeptical kids. It's the hallmark of a good scientist. So, so, so good on you for fanning the flames of skepticism and, and not believing everything that adults say. <laughs> We've got a couple of uh, follow on questions, really. One uh, from David says, uh, thanks for a brilliant talk. Can we really get meteorites of lunar and Martian origin as sold on the, inter on the internet? Right. And then, um, then the Sadiq wants to know, have you studied any me meteorites from Moon and Mars and how are they different from the asteroid ones? Right. Great question. So, yes, we do get meteorites from the Moon and we do get meteorites from Mars. But as for the authenticity of them when you buy them online, I can't personally vouch. I have a, I have a meteorite dealer, a great chap called Martin Goff. Um, if anyone wants his details, I can, I can pass them on because he's, he's, he's really great. There are a couple of meteorite dealers in the UK, actually, and there's a whole meteorite market out there. And it's a little bit like Amazon. Um, if they try to sell you a dodgy lunar, me a lunar meteorite, and it's not a lunar meteorite, and if someone finds out, no one would ever buy from them again. So, um, it, it's, and I've had good experiences buying meteorites off the internet before. And in fact, I have bought a lunar meteorite and a Martian meteorite off, off, the, off Martin, actually, it turned out. Um, so yes, we can get them. And the reason that we can get them is for a very, well, 
Right, so next time, right, so the moon, right? You can even see it with your naked eye. It's absolutely covered in impact craters. And even uh, through a telescope, the moon, unbelievable. It, it, never, it never gets all looking at the moon through a telescope, especially when it's, you know, when, it, when it's a crescent and you get those long shadows cast of the craters and the mountains. And some of those craters, they were energetic enough to blast material off the surface. And some of that material landed on the earth. And so, yes, we have material from the moon that wasn't brought back by the Apollo astronauts or the Soviet Union's lunar missions. We have them as meteorites. And the same is true for Mars as well. If you look at Mars, it's got lots of impact craters, although not as many as the moon because its surface is renewed by, by surface processes like winds and dunes, and it was more recently geologically active. And it's got an atmosphere to protect it from a lot of the incoming rocks, although a thin atmosphere. And some of those rocks can escape the Martian surface and land on the Earth as meteorites. And so, it's, 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 it's remarkable. We have pieces of Mars already here on the Earth that we can study in the laboratory in immense detail before we go there ourselves, hopefully sometime in the next decade, if you believe Mr. Musk and his friends, um, to bring pieces back for ourselves. We already have them in the form of Martian meteorites, which is wonderful. And I think it was Sadiq who asked the question, um, how are they different from the, from the asteroid ones? Well, the main differences are that well, for, let's start with the moon, right? You, you, can, you can tell the moon is geologically quite strange because it's, it's very bright, right? There are lots of white areas on the moon and, and that, that's, not, that's not quite common on, on planetary surfaces to get, to get the same geology as the moon. And that's because the moon is quite, is quite big and it had a quite quirky geological history um, because of the way that the moon formed. Some of you might know that the, the leading hypothesis for the origin of the moon, although it's by no means settled, it's quite contentious, um, in some communities. One of the leading hypotheses, which is a quite a good hypothesis, is that the moon was, was essentially knocked off the early Earth by an impact, a glancing impact with a with the, with the planetary embryo called Theia, it's often called, and the material that was knocked off the Earth coalesced into orbit around the Earth and formed the moon. And, um, and that's, so it's a chip off the old block, essentially, the old block being the Earth. And and the, the, the formation of the moon and then its subsequent geological history, although it's essentially geologically dead now because it cooled down so long ago, I mean, it's got quite quirky geology. And so you, you don't get that kind of geology on asteroids. There are minerals on the moon that you just don't find on asteroids. There were, there were geological processes happening on the moon that you just don't get on asteroids and all the rest of it. And as for the Martian meteorites, well, they're unbelievable. They, well, yeah, I get, they're, they're unbelievable if, if the science hadn't been done. Well, it was unbelievable at first, actually. The, the literature, the scientific literature around the time that Martian meteorites were first proposed to be pieces of Mars was unbelievable. It all happened within a really short space of time. It went from where on earth do these strange meteorites come from to, oh my gosh, they come from Mars. And as you might expect, the geology, or maybe, maybe not expect, actually, the geology of Mars is, is in some ways very similar to the geology of Earth. It had volcanoes and volcanoes tend to produce specific rock types on the Earth, and the volcanoes on Mars produce very much the same rock types, but it's the chemistry and the precise composition of these rocks that are very different to the Earth. And um, there are other quirks as well, like, like the, the age of the Martian meteorites, because Mars has been geologically almost dead world for, for a long time, over a billion years now, um, almost dead. I, hasten to add because there's still some recent volcanism on the surface of Mars the the age of the Martian volcanoes and the the history of the planet was very different to the earth and that's that's somewhat recorded in the Martian meteorites too and so they're about as different as you would expect for a different planet but similar enough as you'd expect from another planet that was volcanically active so I hope that sort of maybe, maybe answers your question that they're similar in some ways but different in others and um, maybe I could come and do a talk about that sometime <laughs> Right. Um, Steve Bosley says, can you say something about the pre-solar grains identified in the Murchison meteorite? Yes, I certainly can. So I would have loved to have spoken about this, but I, I actually ran over time with the talk that I had. And if I'd have put some pre-solar grain stuff in there, then that, that, I would have gone way over time. They'd have been snatching the mic off me. So I guess I'll start four and a half billion years ago when our solar system was a, this dispersed nebula hung in interstellar space. Now, I was very careful with what I said because this nebula was mostly made of gas, but it had some dust in it. Now there's a really, there's a natural question with that. Where did that dust come from? Because the solar system hadn't formed. We hadn't got this, we hadn't formed the disc yet from which the dust that formed the planets came from. 
this was before all that. So where did this dust come from? And the answer, it, it turns out, to cut a long story short, is that this dust came from other solar systems. In fact, it was carried along the winds of dying stars that predate our solar system. And as these stars died, dust condensed around them. Usually, you know, it's very exotic minerals like diamond, minerals called sil like silicon carbide, silicon nitride, which you all, I mean, you've probably heard of, I mean, you've certainly heard of diamond, but silicon carbide and silicon nitride and all these weird minerals that you only get forming in really extreme environments. They got blown into interstellar space on these stellar winds and they got mixed in with the nebula from which we eventually collapsed. And these tiny, and they're called pre-solar grains because they're pre-solar. They formed before the solar system formed, which is why they're called pre-solar grains. And we only find them in the chondrites. And the story of these pre-solar grains are incredible. So to go through it from the beginning, we have the, a giant star that was dying. It was shedding off its outer layers, these ferocious stellar winds, you know, when it was going you know, when it was on the red giant phase of its history or when it was just about to go supernova or in fact, when it went supernova. And we also get pre-solar grains forming when neutron stars collide and you, you get a giant explosion. Pre-solar grains form in a few different environments. These, these grains were blown across interstellar space. They were sprinkled into our nebula. They collapsed down along with the gas to form the protoplanetary disk. They survived the formation of the sun, which was a really energetic event that released a lot of energy. They survived the formation of all the other dust in the solar system and became mixed with it. They survived being coalesced onto asteroids. And at least on the asteroids that didn't melt, they survived their time of residence on those asteroids. They lasted four and a half billion years until they were ejected as meteorites and landed on the Earth. And there we find them in the meteorites today. And there are only a few meteorites in which we find pre-solar grains because they're, they're quite easy to destroy these pre-solar grains. Although they're, they're relatively tough, they've been destroyed in most meteorites. Even most chondrites don't contain pre-solar grains. They have to be the most pristine chondrites that never really experienced any sort of heating on their parent asteroid. And the way that we identify them as pre-solar, it's not necessarily their chemistry, because we find diamonds on the Earth, right? You can't, you can't find a diamond in a meteorite and say, oh, it's, it, this is pre-solar because it's diamond. Because diamonds are... I mean, despite the prices, it's, diamonds are a relatively common mineral, admittedly rare in meteorites, but it's still not that difficult to form diamond. The real secret of pre-solar grains is in their isotopic composition. Now, I'll just do a little aside about what an isotope is for those who can't quite remember far enough back into chemistry. You do isotopes or physics, I forget, but an isotope is basically a different version of an element. So take carbon, for example. There are two stable, that's non-radioactive isotopes of carbon. There's carbon-12 and carbon-13. And both of them, by definition, have six protons in their nucleus. That's because that carbon is element number six. So we've got hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon. Carbon is element number six. It's got six protons in its nucleus. That defines the element. Now, carbon-12 has six protons, by definition, plus six neutrons. And so when you add the six protons and the six neutrons, you get 12. It's got a mass of 12. That's why we call it carbon-12. Carbon-13, by definition, it has six protons, but it's got seven neutrons. It's got an extra neutron, so it's slightly heavier, but it's still carbon because it's got, it's got six protons in it. So by definition, it's carbon. Now, the relative proportion of these isotopes is the thing that identifies pre-solar grains as not of this solar system because it turns out I forget the precise number off the top of my head now. Forgive me, I can't quite recall it, but it's, it's something like 1% of all carbon on the Earth is, is carbon-13. It's something like that. Even if I haven't got it accurate or precise, it's not important. There's, there's a certain proportion of carbon-13 to carbon-12 on the Earth. And this varies from slightly from place to place across the solar system, but it's all pretty much the same. Now, the pre-solar grains the ratio between carbon-13 and carbon-12 is completely wacky. There's no known process in the solar system that can form isotopic ratios of such extremity. And it's not just carbon either. It's true for oxygen in these grains. It's true for silicon. It's true for the noble gases. So, so neon, um, argon, krypton, xenon, basically any element that you measure the relative blends of the isotopes 
in these pre-solar grains, they're completely off the charts of anything that we can measure in the solar system. And so a natural question arises, how on earth in the solar system do you form such exotic blends of isotopes? And the answer to the question is in the question itself. There's no way in the solar system you can form them, but you can form them outside of the solar system around different stars. Because I'm sure many of you know a little bit about, or maybe a lot, probably way more than me, some of you, will, maybe even most of you, will know way more than me about nuclear synthesis. And in the same way that different stars cook up a different medley of chemical elements, they also cook up a different medley of isotopes of those elements. And it's these isotopically different stars, these isotopically extreme stars that form the isotopically extreme pre-solar grains. And that is preserved all the way through, well, longer than the solar system's history. And so I guess I was fibbing ever so slightly when I said that the CAIs were the oldest, the oldest things in the solar system. A more precise thing to say would be that the CIIs are the oldest parts of our solar system that formed. But the pre-solar grains, by definition, have to even predate the CIIs. And there was a paper that came out in the proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences earlier this year. I think it was in January or maybe February. And a team of scientists had, had tentatively dated some of these pre-solar grains. And some of them were about 7 billion years old which is, which is it's, it's, it's older than the solar system by over a billion years, which is just incredible. Um, but the uncertainty bars on those measurements were quite large. Um, but it's still, it's still impressive that that's even imaginable that, that we can do that with modern science. So maybe, hopefully that, um, that whetted your appetite for pre-solar grains. And without sounding too much like a salesman, there's a whole chapter on pre-solar grains in my book. <laughs> so, and I go into the nuclear synthesis of it and, and how, how we discovered them and all that. It's an it's a unbelievably um, dense subject with lots of, of literature. Um, but I, I, if I've done my job right, I picked out the, the, the best bits and, and explained it well. And so um, hopefully you'll enjoy that if you, if you pick up Meteorite. Right. But if not, I hope that answered your question. Thanks very much. We've got quite a few other questions. One, one, right. from, uh, one from Lucy says, um, do you think we have any meteorites from the Kuiper belt? Ah, right. That's a great question. So do we have any meteorites from the Kuiper belt? So just, just for, the, for the benefit of the audience, the Kuiper belt is, is sort of, an, it's sort of like a, an asteroid belt that's much further away from the sun. And it includes the likes of Pluto. It's much further away. It's much, it's much more ice rich and rich in organic material than the, than the asteroid belt, which is mostly made of rocky material. Now, do we have any meteorites in the Kuiper belt? Maybe is the answer. So one of, one of the things about meteoritics is that, so one thing that, and, and as astronomers are guilty of this too. One of the things that we like to do as geologists and meteoriticists is to get, is to get a room full of rocks and see which ones are similar and group them. Okay, just like the astronomers used to do with stars, they looked at the stars and thought, oh, some of them are kind of red, some of them are kind of orange, some of them are kind of blue, some of them are white. Let's group them and give those groups names because we don't really understand what's going on, but we can give them names and maybe we can pretend we know what's going on a little bit. But actually, it turns out that most of the time in science, when we classify things like that, it turns out that that initial classification, just based on quite crude things like the color of stars or, or the or what, or what rocks look like. When we group them into families, it often turns out that there's some real deep insight into the, the systematics and the, and the science of it. So in the case of stars, without digressing too much, in the case of stars, it turns out the blue ones are the hot ones and the red ones are the colder ones. And the ones that are sort of in the middle are sort of not too hot or not too cold. They're, they're like Goldilocks stars and, and that, that relates to their mass. And, and, and how quickly they're going to burn through their fuel and their, their lifetime and where they are in their lifetime. Um, and such is the same with meteorites. Just by grouping the meteorites based on their geological similarities, it turns out that that hints at something quite deep. And one of the things that's come about by grouping meteorites based on the similarities is that it's highly likely that we have that we've sampled many, well, we have sampled many different asteroids but it turns out it's not just random. It, it, so for example, the Murchison meteorite that I mentioned is a particular type of meteorite called the CM chondrite. Don't worry about what CM means, they're just the details, but we have these CM chondrites and there are a few hundred CM chondrites. 
And it's highly likely that all of the CM chondrites come from the same asteroid. And so there's an asteroid out there where the CM chondrites come from. There's an asteroid out there where the L chondrites come from. There's an asteroid out there where the CK chondrites come from. Um, there, are, there, are, there, are, there is an, an asteroid for each group of meteorites. Now, one of the surprising things is, and this, this sort of blew me away a little bit um, when, I, when I first learned it, but, but it's, it's kind of understandable. We don't know exactly which asteroid the different groups of meteorites come from. And in fact, and I, don't, I hate to be a salesman, but it, but it is just at hand. I put a meteorite family tree in the front of my book as well, so you can kind of see how they all relate to each other. And, and we don't know precisely which asteroids the different groups of meteorites come from. Um, it, it turns out it's very difficult to tie a rock or a group of rocks here on the Earth with an asteroid in the asteroid belt. It's very difficult to do that. There is evidence, however, that some groups of meteorites, they, they don't quite fit in with this, this, this hypothesis that they come from the asteroid belt. Their, their precise chemical composition and their isotopic composition are a little bit strange. They're, they're sort of set apart from all the other meteorites um, in, ways that, in ways that just don't seem to, to fit in with, with, this asteroidal world, with this asteroid belt worldview. Now, it's maybe worth mentioning how we know they come from the asteroid belt. The reason we know they come from the asteroid belt is because quite a few meteorites now have been captured on film as they've fallen, usually by accident. In fact, the first ones were in what was Czechoslovakia during the Cold War. They were looking for nukes passing overhead with skyward pointing cameras, but they accidentally caught a meteorite falling. And because they got it from different angles, they could calculate its trajectory through the atmosphere and some very clever people, I, I couldn't even begin to talk about the mathematics of this, but they projected the trajectory backwards into space to calculate its orbit around the sun. And that orbit was consistent with coming from the asteroid belt. So that's how we know that most meteorites come from the asteroid belt. But there, there, is, uh, there are some groups of meteorites that don't seem to fit this worldview. And a, a notable example are the, the carbonaceous chondrites. Um, they seem to be too rich in what we cosmochemists call volatile elements. Volatile elements are elements that evaporate very easily. A classic example is nail polish remover um, or, or bleach or something like that. I mean, if you can try it, it's, it's, it's quite a cool, well, I say a cool experiment. It's not really, but it's a, nice, it's a nice illustration of what a volatile element is. If you put a bit of nail polish remover, which is acetone, that's the active ingredient, you'll, you'll watch it evaporate before your eyes. It's so easy to boil and turn to fumes. And if you imagine the solar system, you've got the sun in the center, and as you get further away, it gets colder and colder and colder and colder. These volatile elements, the, sorry, these volatile chemicals can't really exist close into the solar system because they just vaporize, they, they can't coalesce because they're in the gas phase. They, they just sort of, they get blown away if you like. But further away from the sun, right in the colder outer regions of the solar system, beyond the orbit of Jupiter, perhaps even beyond the orbit of Saturn, certainly beyond the orbit of Jupiter, it was cold enough for these volatile chemicals to, to, to form out of the disk. And they got caught up with the asteroids that formed way out there beyond the orbit of Jupiter. And this is probably where the carbonaceous chondrites originated from. Now, there's, this, there's a really neat hypothesis that I won't go into the details, but the hypothesis states that Jupiter wobbled a little bit earlier on in its history. So where Jupiter is now isn't where Jupiter always was. It probably formed a little bit closer in towards the sun where it formed now. And after it formed, it moved into the inner solar system and then back out to its current orbit. And Jupiter's by far the most massive planet. And when you move a mass that big, it completely, it completely causes orbital havoc all over the solar system. And so all of these asteroids that formed way out in the outer region of the solar system where the Kuiper belt is now, some of those got boom, flung into the inner solar system and joined their sort of their, their cousins in the asteroid belt, which is why we find carbonaceous asteroids in the asteroid belt today. They didn't form in the asteroid belt. They can't have formed in the asteroid belt because it's too hot for them to form there. It's too close to the sun. And so they must have formed further away and they were pulled in. Jupiter doing its thing early on in the solar system. And so to answer your question, do we have, do we have meteorites from the Kuiper belt? Not necessarily, but we do have meteorites from objects that formed probably close to the Kuiper belt, but they're not close to the Kuiper belt anymore. They drifted inwards. 
well, or rather they were dragged inwards into the asteroid belt by the, by the gravitational influence of Jupiter as it wobbled. If anyone's interested in that hypothesis, it's called the Grand Attack Model of, of Solar System Formation. It's quite a new hypothesis and it's, it's, quite, it's quite popular amongst the modelers. Um, and we find evidence for it in the meteorite record because we've got, we've got asteroids. Ceres is a great example. Ceres is a carbonaceous asteroid. We, we, we've explored it up close and we've got detailed compositional data for its surface. And, and there's no way, and we find molecules on the surface of Ceres that, that, that can't have formed where Ceres currently is because it's too hot. It must have come from further out and migrated inwards. Um, or at least that's one hypothesis. There are other ideas. I, I won't, I could get in, I, I'll get into those if you want me to, but, but there is very strong evidence that we do have asteroids that formed way out where the Kuiper belt is and they were dragged into the current place of the asteroid belt by the gravitational influence of Jupiter. So to answer your question, yes and no. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> yes, good. Uh, well, I, th I think there are, We'll have to probably draw close to the questions there because we we, we can't take all afternoon on it. One one last thing um, uh, Linda wants to know, is your book available in the Kindle version? Yes, it is. Yeah, there's a Kindle version and there's another ebook store that I can't recall the name of. So if, if you're not on Kindle, it's on iBooks as well on, on iPad on the Apple one. Right, um, so all the, yeah, for, you can get for it all the quest further questions, the answer is look in the book. Yes, or you can email me anytime. My, my email address is, it's easy to remember, it's tim.meteorite at icloud.com. And feel, please do feel free. I, re, I reply to every email that I get about the book. And um, it might take me a few days to reply, but I will get back. And you can contact me on my website as well. So um, if you've got any further questions or anything, please, please do get in touch. Um, I, I love hearing from people who've got questions about this because um, sometimes people ask questions that I don't know the answer to. And then it's just an excuse for me to learn something new as well. So. That's super. Well, Tim, thanks very much for an absolutely brilliant talk. A lot of questioners have mentioned how much they enjoyed your talk. So uh, thank, thank you very much. much. And uh, the book is, is available. And I think details are available. Uh, I'll put them on the SBA website as well. So if you go to the meetings and events, uh, give me a little while and I'll put the details on there. Thank you very much and, and happy Equinox for Tuesday, everybody. <laughs> right, indeed. Thanks very much, Tim. Thank uh, you. I, I will um, just uh, to, in the final minutes of the talk, I will, of the meeting, I will share my screen and I will talk to you about things that are going to happen in the sky shortly. Uh, let me just uh, get this up. Uh, I usually finish up with a, a what's up. So uh, let me see where we are. No, that's not the one. Dave, can you see the what's up there? We can, Robin, yes. Right, good. Okay, that's done it. Okay, this is just a, a short one because we'll have a meeting again at the end of October. Uh, so just to talk to you one about one or two things, the most obvious thing to talk about is Mars, which of course I expect everybody has seen. It's way up in the uh, in the evening side. The later you are up, the higher it is. This view, as I show you here from Stellarium, shows the view at about uh, 20 quarter past 10 this evening. And uh, you, you've also got Jupiter and Saturn there still. And um, they are starting to sink down into the western horizon, but nevertheless available and a bit low. There you can see Mars, Jupiter and Saturn are all roughly, uh, they're all visible, uh, but uh, a bit low in the sky. Uh, however, we're coming up to the opposition of Mars and oh, I don't seem to be able to change my slide. Next, there we go, right. Um, the this is a picture I took recently. Now, this is not a brilliant picture. It's just one I happen to have. I took this on the 5th of September with the uh, 200 millimetre LX90 telescope. In fact, it was, it was just a, a very quick uh, one just to, to look at the seeing. The seeing wasn't brilliant, but nevertheless, I converted it into a, into a picture. And you can see there that there's a quite a bit of amount, uh, amount of detail visible and a very small South Polar cap 
at the moment, that should not completely disappear because the south polar cap usually remains. But if you're looking at Mars through a small telescope and wonder where are the polar caps, well, that's about the brightest you will see. Now, at that, on that occasion, a couple of weeks ago, it was 19 arc seconds across, but the planet will uh, be getting bigger. And tonight it's 21.5 arc seconds. And at its closest to Earth on the 6th of October, uh, it will have its largest diameter of 22.56 arc seconds. This, if you remember back to 2003, when it was at its very closest for or something like nearly 60,000 years, it was then 25 arc seconds across. So just a bit smaller than that, but nevertheless, this is a very good opposition and you can see quite a lot of detail on Mars. If you haven't observed Mars, this is definitely the year to go about doing it because, and, and do it soon, because it, it's, it's only around for, uh, for the autumn. Opposition is on the 13th of October. People always think that, uh, and it's uh, very nearly true, that when the planet's in opposition, that is exactly opposite the, uh, the sun, the, the, the sun from the, uh, in the sky. So therefore it is due south at midnight. Now at the moment, midnight is of course at about one o'clock BST. So you really do have to wait quite a while to get it at its highest. But uh, opposition is on the 13th of October, but it's not quite at its closest then. Why? It's because the Mars, the orbit of Mars is not, is quite an ellipse and therefore it can actually be at its closest before it is duly op due opposite the sun. And when it is due opposite the sun, a opposition can occasionally occur with when Mars is at perihelion and that's when we get the very largest diameter. This year we have a National Astronomy Week that takes place in November and you think well why wasn't that set for the uh, for the time of opposition and the reason is that as I said Mars won't be at its highest during NAW, uh, during opposition until about one in the morning which is not a good time for people to see it well so it uh, we set oh, about a year ago we decided to make National Astronomy Week in November when it will be at a much easier uh, altitude, it will be about 40 degrees altitude in the early evening. So you may want to wait till then to carry out your observations of it. Uh, but nevertheless, it is um, still going to be still quite large, about 17.6 arc seconds, just a little smaller than the size it was when I took the picture on the screen. So National Astronomy Week will be all online this year. Normally we have uh, public observation sessions around the uh, around the country. I say we because the SBA is uh, is helping to uh, sponsor NAW, and I am the SBA rep on the National Astronomy Week committee, which also includes representatives from the BAA, RAS, FFAS, Federation of Astronomical Societies, and the Science Centres. So we will have a wonderful program in National Astronomy Week, but more about that at the end of October when we have our next meeting. Also, we have coming up meteor showers, and we have the Draconids on the 8th to 9th of October. Now, I remember uh, about a couple of years ago, there was an item on the BBC News in the morning saying, astronomers are really excited about meteors appearing tonight and I thought what what meteorites I don't know about those and they were talking about the draconids and I looked up the zenithal hourly rate of the draconids for that time and it was one per hour and what's more it coincided with a full moon so the chances of you were seeing any draconids were uh, very slim indeed and I did complain to the BBC I think I said I think this is fake news and they they said oh we got it from our science people but uh, anyway, that's uh, that was what they said. In fact, our SBA president at the time was uh, was Tim O'Brien, and uh, they tried to get him to go on breakfast, and he refused, saying this is a non-story. But still, they carried on with it. So, don't take it uh, what they say on on TV for granted all the time. This year, the ZHR, the zenithal hourly rate, will be about ten. Now that is of course the rate that you would see under ideal conditions which won't necessarily apply on this occasion because we have a very bright moon it's very nearly at full and it's more or less planted on top of the radiant not quite but uh, very close to the radiant so it's there if you are a keen meteor observer more uh, satisfactory really is the orionids on the 21st 
to the 23rd of October and a few days on either side of that as well. Now these are really actually quite a good shower. Um, they are not as prolific as the Perseids may be with uh, or the, the Geminids. ZHR of 20 to 25, that is the rate you would see with the uh, with the uh, radiant in the zenith and a perfectly clear sky and a very attentive observer who doesn't fall asleep. Um, but the problem is this year we have a last quarter moon. Now normally a last quarter quarter moon isn't too much of a problem for us but in October, uh, I don't know if you noticed, the last quarter moon actually rises really early, well before midnight. And it's a very unusual sight to be up before midnight and see the last quarter moon in the sky. But you can do it in October and at this time of year. And what's more, the radiant doesn't rise until about 10 in the evening, um, PST. And the moon on the 21st of October rise is, rises about 11 p.m. Uh, so you've got a very narrow window of opportunity to to see Orion in meteors. But maybe the 22nd, 23rd of October will be the time to look and that is the Orion in meteors. So that's what's coming up in the sky over the next uh, uh, month and a half. Our, our next meeting will be on the 31st of October uh, and uh, we, we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, so the details are in, uh, will be in the, on the website and we look forward to seeing everybody. Um, we will, I don't think we'll be doing another meeting between now and then, so do come along and view our next meeting. But don't forget Vicky Video's shows, which will probably continue on Friday nights. Uh, they, they tend to be organised very close to the time, so we don't send out a, a notification about them necessarily, but uh, look on the Facebook, um, SBA uh, Facebook page to see what's up live at 8 p.m. on next Friday and I know it's going to be another Venus special with some of the people who have been involved in the recent discovery of phosphine in the in the clouds of Venus and maybe we'll talk about what what sort of implication this has for life on not just on Venus but maybe on other worlds as well. So with that it's nice to see everybody here hope you enjoyed the meeting thanks to Dave and to Tim uh, Tim, hi. I'll give us a final wave. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's been lovely. Thank you. Good. And he's got a book out in case you didn't notice. <laughs> and so with that, I will stop sharing my screen and uh, thank you all and look forward to seeing you in six weeks time. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye.